Hi again everyone. In this video I'll be walking through activity 7-1 titled Exploring Failover Cluster Management Options. This is from the MCSE slash MCSA Guide to Configuring Advanced Microsoft Windows Server 2012 R2 Services in preparation of exam 70-412. In my edition of the book this activity begins right at the top of page 266. Um, so in my previous two videos we um, created a failover cluster and then we configured, in the second video, we configured that failover cluster for file services. Um, so this is just kind of an overview um, of some of the management options. Um, I did my other two videos almost entirely, I think entirely, with the um, graphical user interface. Um, I want to move into a little bit of the PowerShell commands. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, if you want to be following along and you haven't created your cluster and configured your cluster, I'd recommend going and watching those other two videos first and then coming here um, just to review some of the PowerShell commands. I'm not going to go over every possible PowerShell command. Um, I think there's actually a couple dozen just for cluster management. Um, but I'll go ahead and go through everything that the book covers and try to give a little bit more information than just the step-by-step. -step. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, as in my other videos, we have my primary server as my domain controller here. Um, I don't need to be signed into it, but I will go ahead and get signed in just so we can verify that I have all three servers running. So while that's coming, logging in, um, I have my second server here who's a domain member, but he is not a domain controller. He's just a member server. Um, this is also the first node in my failover cluster. And then I have my third server, which is the second node in the cluster. Again, a um, the server is on the domain, so it's a domain member, but not a domain controller. That's really important for your clusters, um, is that they have similar roles. Alright, so there's my primary, my domain controller. He's not part of the cluster, he's just the domain controller. Um, so as I mentioned in my second video, you can manage your cluster from any of the nodes that are a part of that cluster but I recommend always getting in the habit of using a single node um, for that management. As long as that node is online and communicating with the other nodes, you're good. Um, and again, the reason, as I explained in my second video, just because you can configure it from all of the different nodes, um, if you have multiple administrators, and one administrator comes into one node to do some configurations, while a different administrator is in a different node trying to do configurations, especially if you're setting up the same configurations, those can clash and cause all kinds of headaches. Um, so to keep things smooth and efficient and easy, communicate with your other administrators, and always try to use one node for your configurations. So we see that I do have the cluster up and running. We can open this up and look at the role. It should only have the one role that we installed in, our, in my second video as the file services. It's only the two nodes, server 2 server 3, and it only has two disks. One is the witness, and then one is the actual storage for the services and data. Alright, so to begin, we want to go ahead and just revalidate the cluster, just to make sure that everything is working appropriately. Um, I see right here I've got some, some errors and some critical warnings and stuff like that. We'll take a look at those in a second. Um, we're going to go ahead and get the validation running first. Um, so this is the same validation that you should run before you even create the cluster. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell it to run all tests. You can manually select specific tests, which will then give you this option for your test selection we can quickly look at that and so it, it has a very thorough breakdown of everything that's tested um, so you can select you know I think this isn't working very well you can come in here and test just that one specific thing since everything seems to be working well and I just want to verify that I'm gonna let it run all tests this does take a few minutes um, I'm gonna go ahead and have it check both the witness and the actual storage it will confirm that I have my um, validation test set up um, and it'll go over everything that it's going to test 
which in this case is everything. Checking with both nodes, and then it'll go ahead and run through the testing. So I'm going to pause while it does this. Like I said, it'll take a few minutes. We'll be right back once it's done, and we'll see if it throws any error messages or warnings. All right, so once testing the, verif or the validation tests have completed, um, you'll get a validation report. I mean, it'll give you kind of the basics. It'll show you success or failures here. All right, so we have one warning under network communication, which I'm expecting because I only have one network interface. These are virtual machines with just one interface, so that's probably what the warning is going to be. Um, you can hit view report to get more specific details. Um, so that'll open up most likely in Internet Explorer on your server, um, unless you've changed, and it's unlikely you've changed your um, program default for MHTs to a different web browser or whatever the case may be. Um, so we can look at the network where we have network communication and the specific details are here. Um, the nodes are only communicating on one pair of network interfaces, so one inter interface per node. So if either one of those interfaces goes down or the cable lane goes down or the switch port they're connected to goes down, that node is offline effectively. It'll be still be powered on, but it will no longer connect to the network. It'll no longer connect to the other nodes in the cluster. Um, so that would be very, very bad. So for your best failover practices, um, multiple network interfaces on each node. Um, you want to have at least one for the clients to communicate to whatever services are provided from the cluster. And you want another interface, at least one other interface, and that second interface will be for your node-to-node -node communications. So one for clients, one for node, or one for the cluster specifically, so they can all communicate without having to use the client interface. All right, so we're going to go ahead and close that, finish. So my validation worked, no problems. I want to go ahead just really quickly and take a look at my recent events. You can either hit the link here, or you can just click, click on Cluster Events. Um, it'll show you the, the level. Error is really bad. Warning is like, hey, this could be bad. Date and time. It'll specify exactly which node the error or warning came up on. Um, event ID, if you need to do any additional research. And the task category, network name resource, was my warning. Um, you can get some more details. So this is a lot like an event viewer for a machine, for a Windows machine. Um, it looks very similar. Um, in this case, my warning at least, my cluster didn't have permissions to update the object in Active Directory. Um, more likely, they just couldn't communicate with my domain controller, because my domain controller was still booting up at the time. And I did not protect it from accidental deletion. So that's good to know. Um, IP address resource, this is most likely that my entire cluster was shut down. All of the nodes were shut down. So bringing all of the nodes back powered up, they still had to power up all the services and re-enable all of the network interfaces. So that's probably what most of these are, is just from shutting all of the nodes down and then turning all the nodes back on. Um, so to avoid stuff like that, there's also a built-in utility for cluster-aware updating. So that way you never actually have to completely shut your cluster entirely down. Um, the cluster-aware updating will start at one node. It'll perform, it'll, so it'll take it offline, take it kind of pseudo, take it out of the cluster. Um, it'll update the node, give a full reboot, and then once the node is back up and online, it'll obviously reconnect to the cluster and say, hey, I'm here. And then the cluster we're updating tool will move to the next node, take it out of the cluster, do all of its updates, and bring it back online and back into the cluster. So that way, you can get your updates done, which is a good thing, um, patching any problems, any vulnerabilities, and then you don't actually have any downtime because you're not taking your entire cluster offline at once. You're just taking one node at a time and making the fixes that you need. All right. 
So the next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead. We just want to shut it down and restart the cluster. Um, doing this here, it's not the same as shutting all the nodes down. Um, shutting the nodes down is like shutting the operating system down, powering down the entire machine. Um, you can shut the cluster down while leaving the operating system running. So that way you can do those updates if you want to do them manually or if you need to install a specific piece of software. Um, whatever the case may be, you can take the cluster offline and still have your machines powered on. Um, so to do that, we just select the cluster here. Um, hover over more actions and then we have the shutdown cluster. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And we'll see that the cluster rolls and everything there shuts down. But obviously my node is still online for me to do you know, whatever uh, management or administrative stuff I need to do here. Um, so then to restart it, we're going to go ahead and restart it with PowerShell. Um, before we start getting into all of the PowerShell commands, I want to go ahead and flash them up here on the screen. Um, so this is not all of the commands. These are just the kind of the top level administrative ones. So these are for a failover cluster. Your commands for a network load balancing cluster are different. Um, so we have two completely different clusters here. Um, I'm not going to go into the network load balancing at all right now. I'm just going to mention that if you have the book, um, those PowerShell commands are on page 239. If you don't have the book, um, I'm sure you can do a little bit of research with a search engine um, or go to Microsoft's website and you can find those commands fairly easily. Um, so again, here are the ones for the failover cluster, the command. Um, again, it's going to require a little bit more than just, you know, a very basic thing. So we'll try to get into a little bit of that and then this is just a description of what that command will do um, at a very basic level. So let's go ahead and open up a PowerShell window. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to start the cluster. And so that actually is very straightforward. It's just start cluster. And it should take it just a couple of seconds to power those um, cluster rolls back on. There we go. So I did, we didn't get any warnings or errors, so our cluster should be up and running. If we refresh, actually it will auto-refresh for us, which is nice. Um, we can see it come back online, so that's good. All right, um, let's say we just wanted to get some information, so we can use the command get cluster. Not a whole lot there, but we can pipe that over to format list, specific property, wildcard for all, and we can get a lot more information by piping it with this second command. So domain is correct, the name for the failover, that won't be for the nodes, that'll be for the, the failover itself, the cluster. Um, you add evict delay, access point is with Active Directory and DNS. Um, if you do not have Active Directory domain services, you can still create a cluster um, separate from Active Directory, but you'll still want to do some form of DNS so that you can reach that cluster by name. Um, that's also useful, the alternative to this is use with without Active Directory. Even if you have an, an Active Directory domain, um, you may have an administrator that can't add or remove objects from Active Directory. Um, the other way of creating this node is separate from Active Directory, so that administrator would still be able to cre create the node even though he can't add or remove objects in Active Directory. Um, and then, you know, a higher level administrator would just go and manually add um, the computer account in Active Directory and then register that in DNS. So again, there's a lot more information you can get here. I'm not, I'm not going to go over anything else in specifics there. I'm just kind of review it. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue on. So we want to verify back here. We want to see our roles and see. So our owner is server 3 for the FS service. We 
also just verify that from the top level. Scroll down a little bit here because my window is so small. We have the cluster core resources and we can expand these. And so there's my storage and available space and then the cluster name with its IP address. Um, so we see in the storage at least, so I have this which is actually available for data storage. Um, the first one here is the witness disk. So it's not showing us available data um, space, avail st available storage space or anything, because that disk is the witness disk. So if we wanted to change the owner of core resources, um, I think I did this in one of my other videos, but we can come up here under more actions and we can move core cluster resources best possible node if you've only got two when you select that it'll just sw switch it over to the next node um, or if you have multiples it'll try to determine the best and assign that node as the owner um, if everything's fairly equal and you just want to manually specify a node you can do that right here so we're going to move that over so we're going to move everything from server 2 to server 3 that usually just takes a couple of seconds. So now we're back online. And everything still looks good. We can double check our role. So it was moved to server 3. So we could move a specific... If I had multiple roles, I could distribute those a little bit say I have one I would put one on each node or something like that so it's a little more distributed um, so again same thing best possible or select a specific node um, from the roles themselves um, we have a few more com um, PowerShell commands that we can look at um, So cluster group under server 3 now, because we moved everything to that node. Um, if we wanted to, like we did here, we moved to a specific node. If we wanted to do best possible node in PowerShell, we would give the command move cluster group. Cluster group and that will automatically move it to the best node or the next available node if you only have two so then we can go ahead and give the get cluster group again and we see that it moved from three to node two or to server two node one rather Um, you can also get a little bit of help with some of these commands. Uh, for example, if we wanted to see what else we could do with the move cluster group, just type help at the beginning. And so it'll give you more information you can use. So the name of the cluster group, the node that you want to move the cluster group to, um, the cluster name. So that way you can use that command also to specify, you know, move this cluster group to this specific node, make it the owner. It looks like that covers everything that the book went over, um, plus hopefully a little bit extra. I didn't want to go too in-depth with the PowerShell commands, because PowerShell, even just cluster management, half. Um, so that's kind of a brief intro to them. There they are again if you want to review them, um, put practice with them, or you know research more on what you can do with them. Um, I hope you enjoyed and learned something from the video. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to leave them for me below. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in my next video.